The conference is now being recorded. To give you an introduction to our financial statements of the first quarter, and afterwards we look forward to taking your questions. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is Ludwig Mons speaking. I also would like to welcome you to Calder's Meditech's um, analyst conference on our first quarter of 1920. Please uh, turn to slide number two of our um, presentation, um, which shows the outline of today's conference call. Um, as always, in the first section, I will start um, with an overview on, on the results. Then uh, Justus Wehmer, our CFO, uh, will provide you more details on the financials in the next section of the presentation. Afterwards, I will share some highlights, including some uh, comments on uh, the situation in China in light of the uh, coronavirus epidemic. And uh, finally, I, I will talk about our outlook. So uh, let's continue on slide number three. I am really glad to report that Calder's Meditech could use the momentum of last um, fiscal year and was again able to grow substantially in Q1 compared to the same uh, quarter of prior year. Um, revenues reached 370 million euros um, with strong contributions from both SBUs. Also in terms of regional split, we do not depend only on one region we had uh, significant growth in all of the three regions, Americas, EMEA, and APEC. In total, the growth rate was at 14.2%. On a hypothetical constant currency basis, the growth rate um, was 12.7%. In other words, we um, had some currency tailwinds, and uh, Justus will, in, uh, will go into the numbers more in depth and will discuss uh, growth contributors specifically. The EBIT margin increased to 15.4% versus 14.9% in prior year. Please keep in mind that um, we had some positive impact from R&D capitalization in Q1 of prior year, which means that the improvement on a like-for-like -like basis was even higher this year. Um, but we will address this later in the presentation. Um, the margin improvement was supported by a positive development of the um, product mix, and once again, we increased the share of recurring revenue. Um, but also, careful cost management helped. Um, we have worked with the organization on the OPEX awareness. Um, our net income reached around 39 million euros, which corresponds to earnings per share of 0.43 euros, Prior year, it was 0.32 euros. So earnings per share increased due to the EBIT increase and um, due to the absence of um, hedging losses that occurred in prior year. Okay, um, so overall, the performance developed really nicely, and uh, I now would like to hand over to my colleague Justus, who will shine some more light on the details of our results. Justus. Thank you very much, Ludwin, and uh, also a good morning and welcome uh, from my side to everybody in the call. Uh, we are going to slide five, please, and uh, I'm now going to give you a more detailed overview of our financials, starting with the performance of our strategic business unit uh, of Thermic Devices. Revenue came in for Thermic Devices with uh, 269.4 million euro compared to prior year reported growth is at 12.5% and currency corrected 11.1. Uh, uh, there was strong growth across the portfolio and again, good recurring revenue share. We see continued positive effects from innovations we've launched, like uh, the Clara 700 or the Zero 6000, benefiting our diagnostics portfolio. The refractive laser business continued its strong performance from the past, here, especially our smile technology continues to develop nicely. Again, also a positive trend in surgical ophthalmology, driven by the ophthalmic microscopes, uh, where, as you know, we have launched the Artivo microscope uh, towards the end of last fiscal year. The SBU EBIT margin decreased slightly compared to last year due to some extraordinary or seasonal effects. Um, as uh, Ludwin mentioned earlier, last year Q1 was affected by R&D capitalization, and uh, we also have to remember that Iantec uh, is included fully in the first quarter of this year's financials, 
uh, last year. Indeed, the acquisition uh, was consolidated only in mid of December of 2018. Uh, so from that perspective, we also have an additional expense um, built into the um, uh, R&D expenses of this fiscal year. So we were supported by a more favorable product mix, um, a solid share of recurring revenue, and uh, higher operational leverage. Let's turn over to the next slide and um, cover our SBU microsurgery, which again delivered outstanding performance. Uh, revenues have reached uh, the 100 million euro threshold um, versus previous year 84 million euro. This is a revenue increase of around 19.1% um, and at constant currency still remarkable 17.4% growth. There is a continued strong revenue development growth in Neuro ENT, supported by our robotic visualization system, Kinevo, but we also see a good trend for the new Tivato 700. EBIT margin still very strong and uh, improved even further due to volume effects um, on the one hand side, um, um, uh, but also um, the regional mix and the cost awareness in our organization contributed um, to that um, remarkable performance. Let's now take a look at the regional performance. <clears throat> um, you can see, uh, again, a fairly well-balanced regional split across the three regions. Uh, the Americas um, uh, now uh, showing the 109 million euro of revenue, a strong increase of 18.5%. And uh, at constant currency, 15.5% uh, over last year. The U.S. market itself uh, contributed uh, strongly with the growth of 15%. Um, we also, um, in that region, uh, benefited from the Claro 700 and Cirrus 600, uh, Cirrus 6000, sorry, introduction, uh, and also a good contribution from our MCM, MCS business. Uh, also, the Latin American markets, which uh, last year were somewhat uh, disappointing, um, uh, showed increasing performance. Uh, EMEA with 111 million euro and an increase of 7% and uh, at constant currency 6.9%, uh, again with good growth rates. Uh, the performance is somewhat more heterogeneous. Uh, some markets, uh, major markets like Germany, France, uh, developing with uh, growth rates uh, in the mid uh, single digits, um, um, and some other markets a bit uh, weaker than last year. But overall, um, uh, we are satisfied um, with the performance in the first quarter. And last but not least, Asia Pacific with 150 million euro uh, revenues and an increase of 16.9% and at constant currency 15.5%, again, contributing strongly um, uh, to the overall growth. Um, China uh, with good contribution, but also South Korea and Japan. With that, um, we move over to the P&L. Um, uh, you can see here an increased gross margin uh, um, with roughly 56% compared to previous year due to positive product mix, especially high share of recurring revenue. OPEX in terms of absolute numbers increased, but uh, OPEX margin overall stable with roughly 40% of sales. Increase in R&D ratio, as we mentioned before, we had the capitalization in previous year um, and also um, uh, investments in some of our strategic development projects, which we have outlined in previous calls um, in the field of surgical ophthalmology uh, are contributing to the um, uh, higher expenses for R&D. EBIT um, of 57 million euros significantly above prior year and EBIT margin, uh, as mentioned before, at 15.4%. If we move on uh, to the next slide, the adjusted EBIT margin reached 15.7%. Uh, that's an improvement of uh, 0.6% percentage points versus previous year. Um, there, as you know, are only uh, rather small effects um, in terms of purchase price allocation uh, related, explaining the difference and um, 
here uh, the increase is mainly now from the PPA of uh, Yantec. Moving on, uh, finally, uh, to a quick look um, on the cash flow statement. Operating cash flow um, reached 26 million euro. Um, that is above prior year and is mainly driven by the positive EBIT development. Cash flow from investing activities um, um, in comparison to last year uh, is mainly affected by the fact that uh, in, in last year we had the Antic acquisition and cash flow from financing uh, activities is uh, mainly influenced by changes in our receivables and payables in our treasury accounts. With that, um, I would then hand it back to Ludwin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Justus. And that brings me to the highlight section. And um, as I said before, um, I would like to start with uh, some words on the coronavirus outbreak in China. As you may wonder um, how that um, will impact uh, Carlos' Meditech business. Um, and uh, it's a little bit explained on slide number 12. Um, as you know, public life in some regions of China was basically shut down um, over the last uh, two or even three weeks. Um, however, it's really important to note that China had the uh, Chinese New Year holiday break anyway. And um, this break was extended because of the um, coronavirus epidemic. But nevertheless, um, it looks like people are returning to work starting today. It was in the news this morning. And uh, we really hope that uh, we will return to normal very soon. As we do not have much information from the end customers yet, it's really difficult to assess the impact of the crisis on our business. Um, but let me a little bit explain our thinking. Um, the Chinese New Year holiday period is typically a period with high volumes of surgical procedures. Our customers had prepared for this and stocks um, of consumables were at a high level going into this period. Due to the coronavirus epidemic, um, many hospitals had closed temporarily or at least uh, restricted um, their service of non-essential treatments, and refractive surgery is such a treatment. Um, therefore, the consumption was probably lower than expected, and um, demand for replenishment um, of the consumables might drop temporarily. However, our working assumption is that most of the procedures will only be postponed, but not cancelled. Um, so we might see some um, uh, headwind on our uh, consumable sales in China over the next one or two months, but the lost revenue um, should be moderate. Currently, um, we do not expect the coronavirus epidemic to have a significant impact on our profit and um, the margin of the full year. Um, therefore, we confirm our guidance for the ongoing year, although it will be somewhat more difficult now to get uh, to these um, uh, numbers given the, the crisis. Um, obviously, a, a key question is how long the corona crisis um, will last and how fast the recovery will be. Nobody knows that, and um, we will keep you updated on this topic as the situation evolves. So... Um, Let's uh, move to the next topic on slide 13. I would like to talk about the reach of our products. Um, as procedures with Carlsweiss Meditech devices or consumables have grown uh, strongly in recent times, more and more patients get in touch with uh, size products. That's a very interesting fact, and uh, here I have some um, fun facts on, on this slide. Um, basically, two examples. With our uh, visual health platform, and we talked about that um, before, with that platform, um, uh, which was piloted in India and is currently being rolled out to other countries, we have successfully introduced a new digital business model. The system provides uh, screening for certain eye diseases um, through mobile stations, even to patients who do not have direct access to ophthalmic specialist care. With um, this model, we could reach more than 300,000 patients um, since the introduction in 2015. An even bigger reach we have through our consumable business for refractive and cataract surgery. In 2018-19 alone, we delivered more than 1.4 million intraocular lenses, which contributed to restoring eyesight and improving the quality of life of patients. 
On the refractive side, we sold more than 1.3 million contact glasses for VisualMax for both um, Smile and LASIK, so really um, uh, significant numbers. I believe it's also um, worth mentioning that our forum um, platform, our digital platform um, for data management, is um, currently being used by more than 30,000 healthcare professionals on a daily basis. So also um, that creates um, a big visibility of size in the ophthalmic market. Yeah, that um, were our two highlights. So um, that brings me to the last agenda item, um, which is um, our outlook. Um, so please go to slide number 15. The growth drivers for the medical market in general and in the microsurgery and ophthalmology market in particular are fully intact. And these drivers will lead to further profitable growth, and presumably. Let me mention some of the well-known growth drivers, aging of the population in major parts of the world, um, growing affluence in countries like uh, China and India, but also others, increasing information access and health awareness. These all lead to more patients, and as a consequence, the patient load and cost of the healthcare systems will go up. Kaldas Meditech will continue to follow the strategy which has been successful over the last years. We will continue to focus on our strategic priorities, which are further expand recurring revenue, drive rollout of smile refractive laser surgery, extend technology leadership in cataract, um, lead neuro ENT market by turning next generation products into um, business growth. And um, finally, I would like to mention that uh, digital solutions will um, play a key role going forward. Yeah, for um, fiscal year 1920, we confirm our guidance, um, which are, number one, um, that we want to grow at least as fast as um, the markets grow. Number two, we will keep an attractive EBIT margin between 17 and 19 percent. And number three, midterm we expect an EBIT margin sustainably above 18%. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, concludes our prepared remarks. So we are now happy um, to take your questions, and I turn back to the moderator to explain the procedure. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press 9, followed by the star key on your telephone keypad. Please press 9, star now, if you would like to ask a question. And the first question comes from Mr. Scott Bardo. Please go ahead. Thanks very much for taking my questions. Um, yeah, so I wonder if um, you could share some, some additional insights into the potential disruption for refractive laser consumables in, in, in China. Um, Obviously, these are quite lucrative um, business lines for, for, for the group, and presumably um, your investments into R&D won't uh, moderate as a result of this near-term disruption. So I guess the nature of the question is, do you still anticipate the prospects for the f full range of EBIT margin guidance to be in play, or do you now think you're more prudent to adopt more the lower end? So that's question number one, please. Um, second question um, in, in microsurgery, um, some very good margin dynamics and growth dynamics in, in the first quarter. Um, I wonder if you could talk to the sustainability of these margins at these levels. Um, is this abnormal or is this the new level that um, 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 Carl Zeiss sees? And perhaps some feeling on how significant or important the Tavato product is within this divisional mix. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Scott, thanks for your uh, questions. I will start with the first one, and Justus takes the second. Um, the, the, the question whether, um, given the, the um, crisis in China, we will rather end at the low end of our um, EBIT margin or the high end is really incredibly difficult to tell. Um, as, as a matter of fact, um, it very much depends on what I said before, um, whether um, the procedures are just postponed within the fiscal year or whether they are cancelled. And we don't know that yet. Um, so um, we, we just have um, spoken to one or two clinics, um, and they, they are um, still optimistic 
but even they don't know yet. Um, so I, I think we need to be a little bit patient and uh, and see how things develop. Um, it's clear that um, things are becoming more difficult, right? If if actually some of the um, profitable uh, revenues would be cancelled, um, but that's speculation for the time being, right? And um, from uh, what we see and know so far, we would expect that um, the the effect will not be as uh, significant that it would lead us out of the the range. But again. Uh, I, I really can't um, uh, predict whether it will be the low or the, the high end of the range. We need that range because of that uncertainty. So I ask you for your, your understanding. Yes, Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Scott, um, I think the, the second question uh, referred to the microsurgical uh, business and, uh, the, as you said, the good dynamics and uh, the question about the sustainability. Um, I think overall, we definitely um, acknowledge we have now a portfolio which is as refurbished almost as it could be. Um, you know, it started with the Kinevo almost two years ago. We extended to the <clears throat> um, Tivato and Extaro. And uh, from that point of view, uh, yeah, we definitely benefit right now from the fact that um, all products um, seem to be well received in the market. So portfolio is good. Secondly, um, uh, we have seen uh, through the last two years mainly uh, Europe and U.S. contributing uh, to the um, growth in neuro. Um, as we have reported um, uh, about August of last year, we got the approval for China that could uh, indicate that for this year we can um, hopefully, and provided that Corona is not uh, going to be a lasting um, um, issue, um, uh, that could mean that we also see uh, this year uh, uh, growth contribution for MCS from China. So in a nutshell, we definitely have um, some, some optimism uh, for this fiscal year when it comes to sustainability um, uh, of that growth rate. Um, as you know, we deem that market for MCS as one which is um, rather, let's say, niche market and um, we already command a pretty strong position. So uh, with all the, let's say, uh, pleasure with which we see the current growth rates, but we believe there will be some natural kind of ceilings to it. So maybe that um, is, yeah. Maybe I can add uh, one, one more thought. The, um, uh, when you look at the margin in microsurgery, there are two um, um, factors to it. The one is um, uh, certainly the, the growth, Right. Um, so we now have more revenue to cover our um, our uh, cost base, and this is what what Justus just mm -hmm. explained. If that um, a growth um, or at least the revenue level actually um, can be maintained, um, the, that that will uh, help with the the profitability. The other factor is the profitability of the products, right? And new products, um, uh, the, the new products that we have introduced um, uh, are profitable, very profitable. And um, um, that that also um, that that might um, go down a little bit, you know, the price level might go down a little bit, but the the first effect remains. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'll jump back in the queue. Okay, the next question comes from Mr. Daniel Vendorf. Hello. You can now ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Very good. Uh, so thanks for taking my questions. Um, the first one is on the the revenue contribution coming coming from your refractive surgery product suit overall. Um, can you um, give us an indication how how big uh, this line item is meanwhile, um, both in terms of instruments and consumables? Um, my second question um, would be on um, the margin development in ophthalmic devices. Um, you mentioned already the R&D topic, so my question would be um, how important was product mix um, for the margin development in ophthalmic devices? Thank you. Yeah, um, regarding the um, uh, refractive uh, surgery business, um, how large is that? I really must ask you uh, here for your understanding that we do not break down our revenues to product lines, and that has very simple reasons. 
uh, which is uh, competition. We don't and uh, cannot make this uh, transparent to our competition um, how uh, large and um, uh, you know how profitable the individual product lines are. Uh, let me say this: refractive surgery has become a um, a substantial and a very important business for us. Um, that's pretty clear. Um, but uh, I, I cannot provide numbers for this, unfortunately. Um, regarding the, the margin development of um, ophthalmic devices, um, it's um, indeed um, a, a question of, of product mix. Um, the, the trend which we have been uh, discussing here for, for many years is that um, we work on increasing the share of recurring revenue. And recurring revenue is um, implants, but also consumables. Um, and um, that, uh, th that class of products tends to be more profitable than um, the, the equipment business. And at the same, at the same time, it uh, tends to, to have a different cycle when it uh, comes to economic ups and downs. Uh, and this is why we are interested in, in uh, further um, increasing and growing the recurring um, business. And um, we see a constant um, shift of our product mix um, from the equipment to a larger fraction of recurring revenue. And um, uh, this clearly is um, an important um, contribution to the um, uh, margin development, which we have seen over the last years. Okay, thank you. Answers the questions. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, partly. <laughs> sorry for that, but no, no numbers on product lines. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question comes from Mr. Marcos Gola. Mr. Gola, you can now ask your question. Hi, and thanks for taking my question. Um, so my first one is also a follow-up on the coronavirus. I wonder whether you can give us um, yeah, some additional color how the Kinevo rollout has been progressing so far this year, given that I think uh, the period January to March is quite important for that rollout and the fact you mentioned in the conference call that most clinics have been yeah, busy with uh, with other stuff at the moment. And uh, my second question is on your cost base. Um, so will you be able to postpone some or at least some of the cost build-up you have anticipated if your top-line growth uh, slows down noticeably in order to protect your margins? Thank you. Yeah, I start with the um, first one on the coronavirus. Um, uh, well, we've... Uh, we have received approval for Kinevo in China, um, actually beginning of this uh, fiscal year or end of last, I don't remember exactly, but um, we um, are now in the process of um, ramping up um, demos. Um, this is a, a large ticket item um, for our customers, so they definitely want to see um, a demo, they want to try out the product um, before they um, actually acquire. And the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, given the, the large amount we are talking about, uh, customers um, uh, have to uh, reserve funds and in some cases have to apply for funds. Um, so typically it takes a while until the money is available and um, um, they can actually do um, purchase the product. So in other words, um, the, the, the time scale here is a rather month, um, if not quarters of a year, right, and not weeks. And the corona crisis now slows down the country, hopefully for not more than a few weeks, right? So I would not expect a significant impact on, uh, of the coronavirus on the rollout of the Kinewo because it's just different time scales. The um, yeah, the second question uh, for Justus. Yeah, um, I think uh, you were asking about um, uh, to what extent we can uh, basically uh, breathe um, or adjust our our opex uh, uh, behavior um, if we were hit uh, by uh, negatively in our top line. Um, the answer is, um, you know, we have already a while ago um, implemented um, in our organization concept of what we call resilience, which basically means that if we feel the need to adjust expenses, 
we are kind of uh, prepared and know uh, where and what we may uh, consider in order uh, to postpone um, along the uh, you know cost um, items and expenses by types uh, that we have and this includes you know uh, sales and marketing as much as G&A and R&D uh, so um, from that perspective i can only tell you that we uh, i think we have the instruments However, to what extent we have to make use of it, of course, right now uh, remains um, to be seen. But um, there is clearly a portion on our OPEX um, that is variable and that we will manage um, uh, with uh, a lot of scrutiny if need be. I would also um, like to mention that in last crisis, actually, um, we did not stop our R&D investments, and that paid back when we uh, came out of the crisis. Um, so if we can afford it, and that really depends on what the crisis uh, would be if, if there was one, right? Right now we don't see a crisis, but if there was a crisis, and um, um, then you know we would um, uh, need to make that judgment as, as your sister describes. We, we are prepared. But again, um, if possible, we would continue to invest at least in research and development. Great. Thank you. And the next question comes from Mr. Falko Friedrichs. Mr. Friedrichs, Good. you can now ask your question. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. I would have three, please. Firstly, on China, can you expand a bit on your supply chain there in terms of how much is produced in the country and how the rest is brought into the country currently? Then secondly, on your IOL business, can you update us on the approval process in the U.S.? What are the next steps here and is everything on track for launch next year? And then thirdly, on your diagnostics business, which showed very strong growth again, after launching new products, how long do you tend to benefit from that in terms of growth until the competition catches up, just based on your experience from the past? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Friedrich. Yeah, I start with the China question. Um, the uh, supply chain, well, there are two things to look at. The one is our own manufacturing in China. So we do manufacture also in China, but um, not to a very large extent. Um, uh, so um, uh, given the, the few weeks um, of slowdown that we see right now, I would not expect um, a, a major impact of that. Um, going forward, difficult to predict. So if the corona crisis would last for, let's say, uh, two, three, four months, of course, we would see something. But um, for the time being, um, you know, two weeks, um, we can certainly bridge. Um, uh, then there is the other component, and that is the supply of components which we purchase in China and which are integrated um, into our devices elsewhere in Europe, in Americas, in Asia. Um, and uh, this uh, is mainly electronics components. So we depend on electronics components which are manufactured by several or many companies in China and then uh, are supplied to us. Uh, and here the same thing applies, right? Um, right now, uh, we don't see an effect. Um, if the, the crisis would last longer, um, that uh, definitely would change. Um, but again, I, I have no idea. Um, uh, how long it'll take and how large the, the stocks in, uh, with our suppliers are actually are, right? Because, um, typically suppliers have stocks of, um, electronics components which we can uh, consume and we would need to find out. But, um, again, for the time being, I believe, uh, believe we are okay. And, um, uh, I think, uh, that, uh, this crisis will be over in, in a few weeks. Um, Regarding the IOL business in, in the U.S., there's no news, which is good news. Um, so uh, we are currently conducting our clinical trial. That goes as planned. Um, so there's um, uh, nothing new on that. So I would expect um, that we can hold uh, the, the time plan. Um, however, keep in mind, in the end, um, the uh, final approval will not only depend on us. We need to provide the clinical uh, um, clinical study results um, to the FDA and some more um, documentation, but then it's up to the FDA 
how long it really takes until we get an approval or if they have further questions, nobody knows. So that uh, ha still has some uncertainty. But again, there's no news here, which I believe is good news. And your third question was on um, the diagnostics business when um, there's something new, how long does it take until um, competition catches up? Um, a, a general answer is also um, um, difficult because um, I, I believe it depends on the product. There are certain, and of course on, on the feature. <laughs> so um, in, in some cases, um, um, for example, let's take an, an OCT, and you remember um, a few years ago we introduced um, OCT and geography, and um, then it took uh, maybe a year until um, competitors had something similar. Our main competitor um, uh, was still struggling because their hardware was not prepared for this, so they, although they had some similar feature, it was not as good. Um, so th th then it took them uh, relatively long. If you take um, a, a typical product um, and a competitor would need to develop that product from scratch, so start, we come up with uh, something new and assume the competitor would say, oh, we should have something similar, and they start a development. Then the time until that um, uh, competitive product in diagnostics would hit the market is between three and five years. Yeah? So it really depends. It can be faster if it's just a minor modification of an existing product, um, but if it's something entirely new, it's several years. Okay, thank you. And there are further questions from Mr. Daniel Wendorf. Yes, um, thanks for taking my question. Um, I would have a follow-up question on um, the performance of your rather old legacy products in microsurgery. Um, can you comment on this, how well these products still did in the quarter? Thank you. Um, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm just thinking what are old legacy products. I mean, in uh, microsurgery, um, uh, in, in neurosurgery, excuse me, in neurosurgery, our uh, flagship product uh, used to be the Pentero, which is now um, replaced by the, the Kinevo. And um, the idea of the Kinevo introduction is to really replace the Pentero. So it's just natural that um, the... Um, and Pentero sales goes down as the Kinevo sales goes up. Um, so what we typically do is we um, basically add the two, right? So Pentero sales plus Kinevo sales, and uh, here we uh, clearly see some growth, and this is what results in the overall growth of uh, MCS, so I believe we are good there. In, uh, if you take the Tivato, uh, that replaces um, the Opmivario, which really was an old product, um, you could um, call it legacy product. Um, and here it's basically the same. So the idea is that the new product will replace the old one. Uh, so also the, the old one goes down um, and it will, um, it will basically be um, taken from the market at some point in time. The time scale, by the way, uh, to do this uh, such a transition depends on the approval situation. So, uh, for example, Pentero, we are still selling Pentero in China to a large extent. We will also keep the Pentero in the market um, in a lower market segment, but, but the high end will be fully replaced uh, once we have the approval um, in, in all countries, which in the meantime for the Kinevo is basically the case. Yeah. So, um, overall, um, uh, the, the legacy products are in the process of being replaced, and that's actually um, um, the, the intent. Okay, thank you. Okay, there are no more questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press 9 star now on your telephone keypad. Please press 9 star on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to ask a question, please press 9 star now. Please press 9, followed by the star keypad on your telephone keypad. Okay, if there are no further questions. There are no further questions. 
Then I uh, would like to uh, thank you, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, for your interest in Carlsides Meditech. Uh, we will keep you posted on the development, and latest uh, after um, Q2, we'll talk to you again in our uh, Q2 call. Thanks, and have a good time. The conference is no longer being recorded.